Elizna, Alicia, Amy, Andrew, Mishka, Shannon. Wow. All familiar names. <laughs> Sean, are you seem yeah, to be yeah, familiar yeah. faces? Yeah. Happily. <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for tonight's uh, webinar. Those that uh, have joined, I'm sure you either may have seen my face before, you've definitely heard my voice before. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm pretty sure that most of you are parents. So um, it's uh, it, I know as a parent, it's quite difficult to make sure that you've got your family one side. I've got my I've got my wife and kid basically uh, in the garage. They are not <laughs> going to leave that room for the next hour. So uh, hopefully <laughs> hopefully it stays quiet in the house. Um, but I, I know what it's like uh, being a parent and, and um, you know, having to put kids down or having to feed them or bath them and all of that. So thanks for joining us. Um, so that's going to be a really interesting uh, event. We have got... Quite a lot prepared this evening for each of you. A major topic for many South African families or anyone immigrating uh, is is you know the fear of the unknown. You know what what happens uh, across the pond. What do we do once we get there? Uh, you know what particular steps do I need to take before I've even uh, moved over? You know what um, where, where do I start? You know, there, there's so many steps and, and and so many things to consider. So as it says there, demystifying the immigration process and understanding the Australian immigration and everything related. Um, so those, those of you that have just joined, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you. I will be your host this evening. My name is Sean Kupferberg. I'm sure many of you know me. Many of you that have been invited this evening have been uh, qualified through the skilled migrant program. Uh, so we've gone through the relevant points assessments and we've ensured that your, your application meets immigration requirements. And uh, we have a very special guest that has joined us this evening, uh, which um, Simone will be speaking a little bit later on throughout this, uh, this uh, event. I thought you were talking about me, Sean. <laughs> uh, Robbie. <laughs> you, you, you're you special, mate. We leave, we, we've left you for right at the end. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So I've just been I've just been unmuted. Um, we had we haven't done a I haven't been uh, present on a webinar for quite some time. So I'm actually really excited to have a, ni a nice evening with all our prospective clients and a client that's on board with us already. But uh, yeah, it's great to be with you guys this evening. Absolutely. Um, and uh, before we get started, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like for you to please Go to your kitchen, grab yourself a cup of coffee or maybe a tea. Um, it's not going to get too raucous, but perhaps uh, get yourself a glass of wine or brandy and coke. You know, get uh, get your poison out and uh, just sit down it. and enjoy. Right, so as we start letting more and more people in, um, I'm, I'm not going to keep everyone waiting for too long. So again, those that, that, that have just joined us, um, there will be myself, your host, Robbie Raglis, the founder and owner of New World Immigration, who is the co-host, and uh, Simone, who is a client of New World Immigration. She's just recently been granted her permanent residency, her subclass uh, 189. Um, we've also been in a very humble position of placing many teachers, including Simone, which has been um, really amazing. But without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Tonight's event is really not about how you immigrate each and every one of you have gone through the qualifying criteria. It's not about the particular steps we'd need to go through. We've discussed that too. Tonight, we're really going to be focusing on a number of different fear elements or fear factors, if you will, that uh, we're going to be covering. And um, our, our guest speaker, Simone, will also be covering a lot of those aspects as well as, as she herself and her family um, Sean, her husband, uh, as well as uh, the two-year-old have gone through, you know, so it's coming from the horse's mouth. Um, so just to cover a number of aspects uh, quickly on, on you know, the fears, and, and I've been in the industry for 10 years, so I've, I've heard a number of different scenarios and, and what people are really 
you know, fearful for. But the, one of the biggest aspects is job security. So, ladies and gentlemen, those of you that have joined tonight's event is that each of you have not only been qualified, but each of you find yourselves in a very unique position where your profession is in high demand in Australia, which is highly beneficial. So there's a 3% unemployment rate in Australia. Um, most of these sectors um, that are in high demand would include education, the trade sector, engineering, finance, as well as IT, um, where there's a 95% employment rate in most of these sectors, which means there's a lot of job opportunity available for each of you, um, you know, being on the skilled occupation list. And then another thing is costs. So depending on the pathway that you're looking to enter Australia, you've got two main vehicles or visa options where you've got your skilled visa, which each of you qualify for. The entire immigration process is covered over an extended period of time. Depending on your profession, it can run anywhere between, I'd say, 10 and 18 months, depending on uh, the profession and, and a number of different elements. So the skilled visa and the costs are covered over an extended period of time, right? So that's majorly beneficial. Let me actually just get my uh, camera up here so you can actually see me here. There we are. Um, and then you've also got your work permit. Now, many of you always queried about what are sponsorships like what is that about and the sponsorship process is a very popular process um we've placed a number of teachers through the sponsorship process as well which we've been um very very humble and and um it, it's been so exciting throughout this course of the year where we've been placing teachers tradesmen uh engineers nurses doctors uh we've actually hosted a number of events prior to this because it's become um, a, a, a quite a popular event that a, a lot of our clients have, have wanted to hear. So um, uh, those of you that have just joined us, uh, welcome. My name is Sean. I'll be your host this evening. Uh, we've just started on uh, the topic of, of costs and financing. Now, the work permit process may cost you slightly less to get into Australia. Um, there is, however, an element where you'd have to pay for things like healthcare and schooling. Um, you have higher interest rates and you have higher income taxes. So that is always something that you must be aware of um, when considering the work permit approach. But you can always finalize the skilled visa from Australia. You don't necessarily need to finalize it from South Africa. So essentially what we aim to do is get your skills assessment completed, which is your main portion of the immigration process. And then we'd look at your options. We can channel ourselves into the work permit route or continue looking at the skilled visa or permanent residency pathway. A major aspect or conversation as well is income. What is my income going to be like? Am I going to be able to look after a household? Um, am, am I going to be able to you know, um, go on holidays with my family? Um, can I send my kids to decent schools? Am I able to do quite a lot that I do in South Africa? And I know many of you, I wouldn't say live lavish lifestyles, but many of you work in skilled professions where you've done a lot to get to your point to, you know, do a lot for your family, um, which is obviously why you've attended this evening, you know, looking to go to Australia. The income brackets, to give you an idea, uh, many of you that are here this evening are teachers. So just to give you an idea, the income from a entry-level teacher starts anywhere from 75000 Australian dollars per annum. And that can range anywhere between seventy five and 125000 Australian dollars per annum. Depending on where you live in Australia... I know of clients that are based in Oz, including many plumbers that have been there for six, seven years, started off with salaries a lot less than that. And their two kids, their wife, um, I, I've got a client, uh, Ty Hewitt, his wife was a medical professional and she couldn't work for the first 18 months. She was going through exams and all of this, but they had two kids um, of, of school going age. 
And, uh, you know, they were really worried about, can I actually look after my family? Anyway, cut a long story short, they eventually went through the skilled visa process, found themselves in Adelaide, uh, which is South Australia. He was the only breadwinner and they were able to look after an entire household on one income. You know, so de depending on your income and depending on where you find yourselves in Australia and also depending on your lifestyle, you can definitely make it work, um, especially as South Africans. We, we're quite resilient that way. Um, another major aspect is, and Simon is also going to cover this um, within a, a number of different topics she'll bring up, but what happens when I arrive there? Um, you know, how, how can I prep? What, what steps can I take to actually best prep? New World Immigration is going to provide each and every one of you with multiple networks of platforms uh, through social media and platforms that we've created over the last couple of months to introduce you to families that are in Australia to make this move a lot easier. Uh, many families open their homes. Many families um, offer vehicles. Many families offer job opportunities because they may be in the same industry as you are and uh, they know what it's like. And uh, when it comes to schooling for kids, th this is incredible, you know, because Australia is international, right? Most of your schools are international. Um, most of your students in schools are from outside of Australia, which makes it a lot easier for you knowing that you're not the only one in the boat. Your kids in class are not the only ones from South Africa. So what is amazing is, is that whether you've got an Afrikaans or an English background, whatever the case might be, is that you'll find an Afrikaans student in your son or daughter's classroom. Um, you know, you, you walk through the streets of Adelaide or Queensland or Perth, you are bound to hear um, a serious South African accent or Afrikaans being spoken on the trams. Uh, it's it's very popular. And then last but not least, safety. So I, I, I never wanted to get into too much stats and bore people on stats or anything like that. But I looked at, at something quite interesting. On a global study that was done last year, South Africa, I'm, I'm South African myself, and South Africa is sitting at 149 on the safety zone in terms of all countries around the world. 149, where um, Australia is sitting within the top 15. So it gives you a perspective of what you experience in South Africa and what you could ultimately experience in, in Australia. What's really amazing is, is that we've got families that walk across the road to uh, parks where you know they, they would have gas fires or gas fries. It's there available to the public. You can spend the afternoon there and simply walk all your way home again you know that that is i think whatever it costs you to go through an immigration process to give your family and your kids that opportunity is is absolutely priceless i think as south africans uh, we're so on alert with so many things uh in the country that the idea of immigrating and being in a place that you're unfamiliar with you know it triggers those those emotions those fears but the feedback that we've gotten from our clients is that when they arrive, they have those fears, they leave the airport, they go and stay in their, in their accommodation for the first week or whatever. And the feedback we're getting at that point is like, we, everyone's reaching out to them, everyone's making them feel at home. Um, all those initial concerns that they had are alleviated quite quickly. Um, and I think that that's, uh, it's a misconception to expect yourself to live in fear and have those concerns for an extended period of time when you arrive it's it's often within a week you know you, you get very comfortable there's outpouring of support because people that have gone before know exactly what you're going through so when they're here and simone and i were just discussing that before the 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 zoom started um you know and she'll talk to you about the experiences that she's had with, with the outpouring of support and offers of support from australia for people that you didn't even know so, and I think that that's um, something, if you know, if I was immigrating, you know, I would be concerned about, you know, I'm leaving my friends, I'm leaving my family members. Um, am I going to be alone? Am I going to be sitting in my house alone in Australia? You know, like, to, you know, just like with no social element to my life, but it's so 
untrue. Um, and all the feedback that we that we get from our clients um, is the exact polar opposite. Sure. So without further ado, I would like to introduce each and every one of you to um, our dear friend, <laughs> our client, Simone Skippers. Uh, she's been part of New World Immigration and she's gone through the various stages and steps uh, with New World Immigration. Uh, my colleague Debbie that I work with very closely is one of the head case managers at New World Immigration. Um, she would essentially project manage your case when, uh, when we'd bring you on board as a family. But someone recently got granted her, her subclass 189. Um, her and her family are moving to Victoria. Uh, we were also in, uh, like I said earlier on, in, in uh, a really great position to, to find her work and place her at a really good school in Australia. So again, without further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, welcome Simone Skippers. Hi, everyone. Yes, we had a we were very, very lucky to have found New World Immigration after um, a lot of thought. And yes, it takes a while to finally take that step over and finally decide, yes, we're going to immigrate because we had actually first contacted New World Immigration in 2020, um, which is crazy because we actually only started our processes in 2022. Um, I am a ECD teacher. So my qualification is early childhood development in the foundation phase. So um, foundation phase would be primary in Australia. Um, they don't call it primary. They call things differently there. So you just have to definitely make sure on where you're going and what you're doing. Um, but yes, I'm a teacher and I've been lucky to teach grade one. And I've also been a remedial teacher for, for grade four students. So I was lucky to have a lot of experience in the teaching industry before I started with the whole process. And I think the biggest thing for us as a family was when we had our little girl. Um, so in 2020, we didn't have Hazley yet, but we had already, Sean and I had already discussed immigration for a while together and finally took that step to find out, okay, now how do we get the process going? And in 2022, um, we were actually in the game reserve in the Kruger National Park for um, my 30th birthday. And Hazy was just about to turn one and she had gotten really, really sick. She had extremely high fever over 40, especially moms and dads will know. Um, now you're sitting in the Kruger Park. You can't get out because they're striking. So we could not leave the Kruger Park to get to any closest hospital, now spray or wherever we needed to go because they were striking. And as we went into the Kruger Park um, to go to Skakuza to one of the doctors there, um, the doctor did not know what he was doing. He took a temperature with his hand behind her neck um, didn't have a thermometer or anything like that. And as we were driving off, my husband was just like, no, we're done. And as we were driving off, um, he turned and looked at me and he said, contact New World Immigration, <laughs> we're leaving. We had to um, drive back the next day to get to the pediatrician as fast as we could because we were really worried about the fever being over 40 and we could not get it down. And as we had finished at the pediatrician, I actually got hold of Leo. That's who had actually helped us in 2020. And he's the one that um, started our whole process with New World Immigration because I had just like re-emailed him. So I didn't even start the process again. I had just popped Leo um, a message saying, I'm back from two years ago. Is there any chance you can help me? And <laughs> he was absolutely lovely. And he's like, yes, of course we can, Simone. Um, this is the details. This is how we go. And we had actually asked Leo if we can do two options where I, I apply and Sean applies because we both fell. What was awesome is we both fell on the short skills list. Um, Sean has a trade. And because I'm an early childhood teacher, um, because depending on um, with teaching, depending on where you are, early childhood, primary, secondary, this can also be um, difference for visa applications. As far as I know, Sean, I think yep. each one falls under its own like process. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it becomes quite unique and and uh, specific to the profession. But you you you're spot on. Yes, and that's that's how our journey with New World Immigration started. And what I which which I really liked was everyone's allocated there to a specific area of what they work. Like Leo couldn't take us further in the process, and he would hand us over to our case manager. So he was the one that got us started, 
make sure we had the right skills and all of that to do. And then we were handed over to the next person. So I feel like that's also a really nice thing about new world immigration is that you don't have one person trying to juggle too much. You've got your people in place to do the certain things they need to do. And that makes a huge difference. And when you are passed on, there's constant communication between the different people in new world immigration. Like we actually started with Regina, but she had actually left new world immigration and she passed oh, us on to me. Yeah, she, she was her. incredible. She was great. She really was. <laughs> I love that she like um when I would phone her, she was actually quite stern, Regina. And then I'd always be like, Regina, like, are you hearing me? And she's like, Yes, Simone, this is how it's done. One, two, three, that's it. <laughs> and um, that's what I love about all the personalities there because Debbie is much more um Debbie loves to giggle. So every time I'd phone Debbie, then she's giggling. So I was so used to Regina, who was stern, and then Debbie came along and Debbie would giggle, and she had a, a, a much more, I would say, playful personality. So yeah. that's what's nice is that, you know, you're just working with people too. Um, and that's important because it's it's nice to meet those different personalities and know that everyone's got their place and everyone's got a personality because it just makes you feel a little bit more at home. So that's what I enjoyed about um, New World Immigration. And something that stood out for me was once we had gotten to the process where we had to now start uploading all these documents so we could decide on what visa we were going through was that New World Immigration has, it's kind of like, I can explain it like a tab system. So you go onto your portal, um, you get a login details, you go onto your portal and um, what was very interesting for me was it's like a tab system. Everything's got its little tab where you need to load passports, where you need to load tax documents, because the Australian government asks you for everything. From what you ate from dinner last night to clothes sizes. <laughs> no, I'm just joking, but it does end up feeling like that for the amount of information you do give them. So I feel like New World Immigration made that so easy because everything was under a little tab system. And I'm a very organized person. So with the amount of documentation needed to go over, you, you feel a little bit flustered. So you start to get like, oh, my soul, I need this. And then you need tax documents. You need um, pay slips and all of that. And there's a hundred of them. And where do I put them and where do they go? So I can tell you one thing. I think a lot of people think, oh, my soul, what am I going to do? Why would I pay that much for an agent? I can promise you they make the process so easy for you. For you to try and figure out what documentation at what quality that's another thing you don't even know. Your documentation has to be scanned in at a specific quality and everything. I mean, those are all the small things like Debbie helped us with and Regina helped us with because it sounds so silly, but that's something that can make your visa take a year or your visa take three years because you don't have the documentation. Or, you know, the Australian government can turn around and just say, I'm not going to deal with this applicant. I mean, every time we're asking for something, they don't have half things. And with New World Immigration, it's just all there. So you know the day you apply and you send all of that in, the chances that they're going to ask for, for anything else will be something that was not planned, if I can say so. So I really enjoyed that part. <laughs> and then we were waiting We were waiting on our visas. And um, Sean and Luke, Luke is also part of the um, recruitment um, side, kept phoning me. Because we couldn't wait. Rate. We could not wait to phone you. And we just try to plan like when when should we phone Simone at the right time? And I, I sat down with, with Luke and I said, mate, we've got so, so many opportunities lined up throughout the East Coast of Australia. We have to phone her. We have to phone her. We know that her visa is going to get approved. You know, I mean, we can't guarantee anything, but I mean, you're a stellar candidate. There's no way your application's even going to get scrutinized. So let's, let's put you forward. And uh, sorry, I, I interrupted there. No problem. Um, no, I was really happy because, I mean, it was crazy because, as you know, Sean, as I had, I had actually gone for three interviews. They were all online. And um, I think the one thing to take in mind is that remember that we are quite a few hours behind Australia, like quite ahead of us, depending on where you're having your interviews in the country. It can vary from seven hours to nine hours to six hours. But um, to keep that in mind for your interviews, because your chances of having a, having a, interview at six o'clock in the morning was is pretty big I did a few of those and I did three interviews got three job offers and ended up choosing one of those job offers that I was help I was really really um grateful for and I'm sure if those three weren't a match that um Sean and Luke and everyone from your side we, there were so many more that we could have chose from but that's that's what I love is that you guys um 
looked it into, asked me what my personal preferences were, said, give me these types of, um, you know, like documentation. What would you like to do? And I was ready to kill you guys because every time you phoned me, I thought it was Debbie telling I me. I know. <laughs> and it wasn't. <laughs> So every time oh, I answered that phone, it was such a, like phone, a bittersweet conversation. I'm telling you, every time I answered that phone and I heard a male voice, I was like, "Yes, but no, I thought you were Debbie and you're not Debbie." <laughs> oh, I think for shame. us, that was the hardest, the hardest part of the process was waiting. It was it was waiting for our visa to come because everything else worked so smoothly through you guys that the hardest part was the wait. It was that cool. waiting on um, that visa approval. And yeah, um, we were very... I mean, at the mercy of the government. I mean, you're literally at the mercy of the government as to when yep. they approve these things, you know. we And that's the thing, you know, you want to do everything humanly possible where you have control. And then mm -hmm. once it's submitted, that's where the control ends. You can follow up and you can push them along and you can... But they are very sticky about... And, that, and, and because the waiting time is considerable, you don't want to ever have to repeat it again through one document that you maybe missed, that you submitted that was incorrect, or you didn't dot an I or cross a T, and it happens. Like there's, there's, they will pick out the most random, small, technical. I remember I had a client, we put their work experience on, and it was a series of, of, of jobs that they had. We put like the dates and, 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 and they would, they would literally follow on. And we had one date overlap. They they called us and said we need to we need to have this document resubmitted or reprepared. So they actually they are so sticky. That's why it's so important to to get it right first time. No, I totally agree. And another thing that I realized was I saw um, a lot of other um, applicants doing like well not through New World Immigration but people trying to do it on their own and end up spending so much more money because of silly mistakes than they would have actually ever spent on agent fees or, you know what I'm saying, actually using a company that knows what they're doing. I've seen so many people make that mistake because they could have selected the wrong English test by accident, which cost 4,800 Rand. I mean, it's not a mistake you want to make. Silly, silly little things and end up paying so much more than what they would pay New World Immigration or whatever immigration agency because you it looks like a lot of money like when you're looking at it you're thinking oh my soul I, I don't think I'm going to be able to afford this but I promise you I think we would have chopped off our legs to do it if we had to because the the help that we got and like it, like I say like you say as well it's small little things they are so nitty gritty like I sent in a document and Debbie was like no way Simone like your logo at the top is like a little bit tiny little bit like it was not in the scan and I didn't even notice that and Debbie was like rescan it to me and I mean that was one out of a thousand documents so every little thing is checked it's like I actually wrote it here it's at 100% reassurance which makes you want to work with new world immigration because the, the thing, it's the not thing that you guys can guarantee a visa but that reassurance yeah. that everything is in place for me to do it and I mean at the moment if I'm not if I'm incorrect you guys have a hundred percent success rate no, no, no. We, we've, we've submitted close on 7,000 applications in 11 years for multiple countries and multiple visas. So we're sitting about 99.3, 99.4. So we don't, we don't actually touch cases we can't process. And mm -hmm. that's the, so we are so, for the lack of a better word, anal when it comes to yeah. qualifying candidates. Um, we just don't touch any cases where we feel that there might be a chance of rejection. It's such a invested time for the applicant as well as ourselves. It's lengthy and we we sure as hell do not want to send people down a, a pathway um, that's going to ultimately lead to rejections and things like that. So, and it's nice that we picked those things up earlier. We've been doing so, done so many of these applications that we can spot things a mile away before they rear their heads, before it becomes an issue, you know? Definitely. And we found that, I mean, like I say, we were very lucky because our visa process went really smoothly. I did see someone asked, um, how long did our visa process take? And it took us a year. And that was like, I can truly say a smooth year from starting with Leo. It was actually October, 2022. And then ending off with our visa. Um, and it was a smooth process, but you should be like Sean mentioned, you should be open for anything from a year or two. Um, I know some can take longer. It can be the minor, the most minor little thing. Like Debbie was telling me, one of her other clients got asked to resubmit new documents and it was for them to prove that they are like lawfully married and they had been married for like 12 years, but we never got requested <laughs> to add that document. So it all depends on the Australian government. I mean, at the end of the day, that's got nothing to do with new world immigration. We just 
you guys just handle it as much as you can and pass on the information as soon as possible. Sure, sure. The no, thing is, like, right in, in the way that we, the way that we like to prepare our service offering and how we modeled it was that we understand that everyone's sitting here in the Zoom, Simone, as well. You guys have lives. I mean, think about how much free time you have. Like, I, I run two companies. I've got two kids, two small children. I don't have a second to breathe, and. You know, if, if you've got busy lives and now you are undertaking a very complex, very intricate, very detailed process that takes time and needs to be done correctly, how do you really allocate time to, 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 to doing it? It's almost like kind of like having a wedding planner. You want it to be perfect. You want that day to be perfect. You don't want anything going wrong. And you want to be able to live your life and you want to be able to go to work and not have to worry about these things. And I, I mean, the, the value that's attached to that problem being solved is, in my opinion, way much more than what we charge for our services. It's just, oh, it's just reality. Yeah. I can, I can truly vouch for that because it yeah. made the process. That's why I keep saying the process for us was like, everyone told us immigrating is going to be like this, blah, 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 blah. At the end of the day, it was so smooth. Sean and I were like, are you sure, are you sure this is how it's supposed to go? Like, everyone thought <laughs> it was going to be an absolute nightmare. We kept like, maybe, like, are you sure new world immigration isn't like that? That makes me like, like super it just went happy. so smoothly. <laughs> that makes me, I mean, you couldn't make the CEO happier. Like, that it makes really me happy. It really was. It's, it's, it's just truly the truth. And I must say, like, if Debbie wasn't sure about something, she was off that phone, had found out from you guys, and back on that phone with us within five minutes, you know. Everything was always like, that's why I said that reassurance. We are, we are too busy. And that's also where slip ups come. Slip ups come when we're too busy and we're trying to do these things in the middle of the night. So why try and do it yourself? It's really not, it's not worth it. I would have never been able to cope. And with there's, it one common there's one com common character trait that we look for when we employ staff, especially our case managers. And that's the ability to, like, they've just got a, an, 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 uh, They've got so much care for their clients and we look for that when we employ them. Um, we don't really look for like overly like educated people and degrees and MBAs and legal backgrounds. We don't look for that. Like, for example, Debbie's a great um, example of what I'm talking about. She, sure, I, 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 like Sean, like, do you, do you think that Debbie would like give a limb for one of her clients? I think I'm I think pretty she sure she I, I'm I'm pretty sure she has because she came in limping one day. So I'm I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I wish she was I actually wish she was on the on the webinar. Yeah. Um because she's absolutely fantastic. We're in, in love with her. She's just a may an amazing human being. And we love the fact that she loves her clients so much, you know. Um and for me, it's just an amazing an, ama an amazing thing. Yeah. Robbie, I think it also stems from uh, management, guys. And I don't want to sound all cheesy and uh, blasé about it, but um, you know, it, it definitely stems from management. So when you look at the the management team that runs the Australian department, um, Jonathan Pretorius, as an example, he has such a close knit community with his clients, and he's still in contact with uh, families that he got over when he started his career about fifteen years ago. You know, yeah. people have applied for citizenship like three times. You know, you don't have to apply three times, but so they've been there for that long. Um, you know, so them seeing that from the top has has trickled its way down and it's it's, it's embodied itself into each and every one of the case managers yeah, that agree. you will soon be working with, you know. Um, but Simone, I'm, I'm interested for, for the listeners to also hear about your journey. You know, what, once we managed to get your, your 189 approved and, and, uh, we, we helped you with, uh, with, with, uh, yeah, you said three interviews and of course you got placed. Um, but after that, you were then in a position having to also look for property. So t t talk, talk to us about that, please. I would like to mention that because it also has a lot to do with, I see a lot of people are asking about job opportunities for husbands that are in the electrical field, stuff like that. So that also lets me go back to my husband, Sean, um, who, so what happened was as soon as I got my job, um, Sean had applied. So he didn't do it through you guys. He was in a completely different field. He hadn't even started to look um, into new world immigration yet. He actually just decided to look on seek. And as soon as he had that visa, because he had looked at it before, and a lot of them didn't come back to him. But the minute he uploaded that visa, stating he had that visa on seek, 
a company, there was actually a few companies that had come back to him. He had also done interviews on his own. And the yep. people that um, Sean ended up signing a contract with, he's um, an instrument mech, so he also has a trade. Um, oh, but Sean, I didn't catch him fast enough. <laughs> yeah, we, this it happened so quickly. Hey, Sean, that's why I yeah. say is that Sean didn't even get a chance to speak to you because he had like he was doing his own research on the side while I was doing all my interviews. And sure. the company that actually came back to him is a South African, it's South Africans that have opened a company there in Melbourne. And you won't believe his work is 20 minutes away from mine. Unbelievable. That is really, so really it just shows you that anything is possible and that there, there's the there is always a there's a way after it because there's a lot to consider once you've received your visa and now great we've got job offers we've got all of this but then it starts okay where do we go where are we going to live how do we get this process started I think especially for us um, families that have children like we've got a little Hazy who's two you don't want to end up on the other side of the world and you have no idea where you're going to be living and where you're going to be staying because with them you want to try and keep that routine and that you know as as much as normal as possible especially when they're so yeah. young um Absolutely. and that's where i had posted on a um a south african group and it's actually a girl that's part of one of your groups that you made on facebook that had made this group herself for for south africans living in melbourne and okay. um so that's just crazy how the links all tied together and how we all kind of stick together and help each other out and she had made this group so i wrote something i know the process of getting a rental from south africa can be quite um difficult and you know like do they have any advice, you know, can, is, is there a way to start the process while we're still in South Africa? If not, you know, what's the best advice for the minute we land there and all of that. And one, um, one of the girls actually um, found a, a rental agent that helped her from South Africa, which is actually not always that likely. And that's what had happened. And she had referred me to her and then a fellow South African who actually immigrated to Australia in 2014 um sent me a message and said he was going to sell his house and they've decided to rent it out they just get in with a rental agent and what's going to happen from there like he sent me photos of the house and everything and he was like would you be willing and we were like yes if we can get that help and we can secure a rental from South Africa before we even arrive and it was amazing because it actually worked into our budget because what we had started with was we made our whole budget according just to my salary because we weren't sure at that stage if Sean would have a job before or not sure. going over to Australia. So it's nice to just see that everyone is a little bit confused in the beginning and they they are they are there is ways to get answers. And so we just determined it on mine. And you won't believe a uh, five bedroom house, three living spaces, the most beautiful back garden back garden for Hazy to play in, fell into a budget for actually if only one person was working in Australia. That's really incredible to hear. And I think that's a bit, that's one of the biggest worries, I think, for, for many South African families, you know, um, we, we always hear this, this, this idea and, and in some cases it's true, depending on where you're going, you know, but you know, first of all countries, they're so expensive. Am I going to be able to look after myself? Can I still live the lifestyle, you know, that I have over here? Can I still provide, um, you know, all of this to my kids? Can I still, you know, some semi have a luxurious lifestyle if I will can I eat out can I go on holiday you know these sort of things which which we all enjoy doing as South Africans you know so I'm I'm really glad you mentioned that so. no definitely and another thing was like when you were talking about different um classes of visas um we like I say we were very lucky to get a 189 which is a permanent residency I think people would cut off their limbs like you talk about Debbie cutting off limbs people would cut off their limbs for a visa like that just because yeah. of the things it comes with and yes the process is a little bit more expensive but for us in the end I can give an example we were looking at different schools for Hazley, and because she's under three childcare is quite expensive in Australia because the teachers are so highly qualified and there's so much that goes into um, childcare at that age. That it and they're really good businesses. <laughs> so they know yeah. how to charge. <laughs> no, they really do. Um, so if you're looking at childcare for a child under two, um, you're looking at about, I would say around $130 a day. Now, I don't want anyone to put that back to Rand unless you have that glass of wine Sean was talking about because you, you'll be in a bit <laughs> right. It's really expensive. But what's nice about the 189 is that we get subsidy. 
And even if you don't get it directly, like let's say she starts school in January and we only, you know, we are, if I know there's a bit of a waiting period at the moment. There's a three, four waiting period. There's a back pay on that too. So it's all these small things that are really like important to know. And I mean, like that subsidy makes that meaning half. Sure. Yeah, so I mean, going, for, going for permanent difference. residency, going for the permanent residency option is just uh, an absolute no-brainer. Don't question it. You've got to do it because the cost saving when it comes to healthcare, um, schooling is just enormous, yeah. absolutely enormous. And it yeah. makes up for all the, the, the financial concerns that you might have about living in that country. Yeah. I think Guys, I'll more. give you an example. Um, sorry, someone, I'll give you an example. So I placed, um, I placed uh, uh, two guys from Null Sprout at a farm um, in, in Queensland on a macadamia farm. Now they both went over on permanent residency and I recently got a farm manager on the same farm, which I placed him there as well. And he's gone over on a work permit. Now he's earning a very similar income, but he's spending about $10,000 more on annual taxes just because he's on a work permit, $10,000, you know, so that is a huge amount of savings where again, you know, you might look at the, the skilled visa. Wow, this costs so much. But when you find yourself in Australia, you start benefiting from those costs that you've incurred from day one, you know, so it's it's highly beneficial. Sean, I just want to just jump to some, I just want to just, sorry, Simone, I just want to just jump to some of the questions in and out because some people have just asked some questions in the chat and I've, and I've always wanted to be this person that jumps to questions in a chat. Um, so just let's just do, we'll do one or two questions and we can jump back to the, the topic of conversation. So Lorna asked at the top here, my husband is as qualified fitter and turner, is sponsorship available? So yeah, Sean, so... Uh, over the last couple of months, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be covering this question across the board because many of you are also going to be asking about various other professions. So yeah. we, we've taken the, the the step of looking at the skilled occupation list and then taking a look at the clientele that we have on board because eventually they'll get their visas at some point. We need to make contact with companies that are offering either sponsorship opportunities mm -hmm. or at least have vacancies in Australia. So prior to our clients either getting their skills assessments done or prior to them getting their visas approved, we've gone out and sourced work opportunities for our clientele already. So it gives us the added advantage <laughs> to, to find work opportunities and present you with opportunities while we're going through this journey. Yeah, for we got, I think, Sean, how many companies do we have that want for and turners? I think three. Uh, on the books, five, five yeah. currently. And, and they, they, they in both the East Coast and the West Coast of Australia. Okay, so our next question, what is the best skilled visa that guarantees a chance for entering Australia and getting PR? So just to clarify that question, so a skilled visa and permanent, a skilled visa is a permanent residency visa. Um, so you would want to enter Australia on a permanent residency visa, which is an amazing thing that Australia grants people. It's very rare that we have this in, a, in the immigration world. With other countries, it doesn't work like that. You often have to go over on a work permit and build your way up and eventually get p permanent residency and then get all the benefits. And You know, you might not have, have visited Australia once and we can get you a permanent residency application approved get on a plane and you arrive there for the first time, walk through immigration, get stamped in as a permanent resident. From that point, you're a permanent resident. You can open up a barber shop, a fish and chip shop in Sydney. You can work as a janitor, a teacher. You can become vice president. Well, I don't know about that, but there's, there, you can get so much opportunity being a permanent resident. And that can be arranged before you even enter Australia, which is what we do all day, every day. We were so clueless. We actually didn't understand what a 189 was until Debbie explained it to us. And she the was Rolls like, Royce of visa. you do not understand what this visa is. The fact that you got invited to invited to apply for this visa, you do not understand what this means. And we had obviously done a little bit of research and Sean and I were like, oh my soul. It's like when we get 189 approvals, which we get a lot now, um, like the whole office, I mean, I can, I want to show you guys some. I want to show them some. 
So, That's quite something. We all celebrate it um, once we get one of these visas, or in fact, any visa. But this, so that's this what visa happens in on our group, on our WhatsApp group at work when there's oh, approved. Okay. It's like, and then literally every day we get like all of these. Just they're just everywhere. Like here's <laughs> seventeen um, smiley faces, fifty-eight flames, forty-eight um, arm muscle muscles. <laughs> because and that's and that's just testament to we just love it you know we love the industry we love approvals we love helping people and when when the case managers get approvals we celebrate it um company-wide the whole company is made aware of any approvals that we get so so my, before meeting you tonight and seeing you for the first time i had heard your name okay 20, 30 times in the office <laughs> Yeah, we were quite busy and every time Sean and Luke would phone me, I'd say, I'm going to kill you guys. I'm going to kill you. I'm so glad you are phoning me and helping me, but I keep thinking you, Debbie. <laughs> Crazy. Um, Tom, yeah. I actually wanted to ask you a question. Um, yeah. This is how I understand it in the research Sean, my Sean and I, we had done was that yeah. um, when you get a 189, so you get a permanent residency yes. visa, as far as I know, you only have to be in Australia 12 months from the day you arrive to apply for citizenship. So when you let's say if, let's say for argument's sake you were granted your visa today your 189 you'll be given 12 months to enter Australia to activate your visa right mm -hmm. so your medicals and your police clearances are essentially valid for 12 months so they want you to enter Australia on it before those documents expire okay now your visa is granted to you for a period of 5 years so Australia would like for you to settle within that 5 year period Okay. Once you've lived in Australia as a permanent resident for four years, that's when you become eligible for an Australian passport. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to get some clarity on that because I wasn't sure myself. No, you kind of want to move over with you kind of want to move over within a year of activation, eh, Sean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because at the end of the day, the sooner you start settling in Australia, the sooner you start eating into that four-year time frame to become a citizen. Um, you know, Australia really like wants you to be there for forever. You know that that's uh, they'll obviously allow you to travel back and forth, going home, visiting family, going on holiday, those sort of things, or traveling, you know, throughout Australia, or wherever. But because you work within a profession that's in high demand, they want longevity of that. They they want you to settle. Um, where many countries scrutinize citizenship, you go through so much to get a U.S. passport. You go through so much in many cases, to get a Canadian or a European passport. Um, where in Australia, they want you there for a long period of time, which which is incredible. And it's nice that they give you that 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 window. Because think about it. You got your visa approved, and Simon, you're, on, you're in the exact situation right now. Get your visa approved. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, we now have to plan this, this move, but you've got so much time to do it. There's no rush. There's absolutely mm -hmm. no rush. You know, um, and then you 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 have the ability to really start looking for work in the place that you want to settle in. Um, you can start preparing uh, your finances, moving finances over. You can start thinking about if you have if you put if you own a home, you know, selling that home, or maybe you want to keep it if you go over. Um, but it, 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 that that window is a really nice period of time. It definitely Absolutely. is. I mean, as soon as we got our visa, we were like, okay, thank you. I think the thing that took <laughs> the longest was, you know, like obviously you don't want to leave on a bad foot for employment on the site. So it was giving your your notice. You've got to also remember that is that um, depending on if you're still working or not, you've got to give notice and stuff to your companies. And that's one thing I can truly say is I would never leave on a bad foot when it comes to your ex-employees because you're going to need a lot from them. Um, reference letters, things like that. Oh, yeah. So I always say, don't burn that bridge. Um, so even though you're really excited for the process and all of that, you do need a lot from ex-employees and stuff like that. So I would definitely not burn bridges and and do it the best way you can. Absolutely. So no, I couldn't agree more. Um, but it also, I think, ladies and gentlemen, this is something that you must also understand. And and uh, you, you'll, you'll, you'll notice this very quickly once you land in Australia is the work ethic and the dedication the average South African has, testament to what Simona just mentioned now, is it's not up and leaving because you now got permanent residency in a first world country. You know, you stay commitment, finish off your commitments, and then you move over. But the points I'm trying to get to is, is that the demand for South African skilled professionals is at a very high level. Because of the work ethic and because of the dedication you guys have, 
to your day-to-day -day role. You know, um, where I'm, I'm not going to blanket form or label uh, the average Australian, but a lot of these countries are very cushioned. A lot of these national uh, um, nations like uh, Australia or New Zealand are looked after by the government heavily. Whether you work or not, you've, you're very looked after. Um, you know, so in South Africa, we don't have that. You know, you, you have to work, excuse <laughs> my language, your ass is off to put food on the table. Um, and if you don't, you're on the street, you know, mm. and you, you, you apply that same mentality in, in Australia because it's just who we are and employers love it, which gives you the opportunity to climb the ranks, um, whether management is on the cards, whether higher salary is something you're looking for or even starting your com or your own company somewhere down the line. South Africans do that. Yeah. And there's so many South Africans there and willing to help when it comes to work, um, accommodation, whatever it may be. Um, I had someone message me and ask, can we pick you up from the airport? You know what I'm saying? So just having, just to know that you've got that little bit like that taste of home there too, and that everyone is willing to help because everyone's been through it. Everyone's gone through that experience that also makes such a huge difference. I think everyone, as I can see, the questions are more in the um in the starting processes of understanding occupation and what visas and stuff like that. But when they get further into the process, they'll realize how important all of that is and that they shouldn't have to worry about all those things because it's just, I promise you, the South Africans, they are amazing. And I think our work ethic as South Africans is top class. Um, I, I see it. I've, I've been to other countries before. I've been very privileged to have also lived in America for a year. South Africans just work hard. Mm, I really feel yeah. like we are a hardworking nation. So it definitely gives us that like little bit of an upper against other countries. Yeah, so that, that, that's, I mean, when we, when we go out into the marketplace and we look for companies that are perfectly suited for our clientele, the companies that we engage with first are so receptive to the idea that we're an immigration company that has an active recruitment division. They absolutely love this, this scenario. And they are queuing up at the door, waiting for our applicants to get done with their visa process. Some get some get done in the replay. Some some had to happen sometimes before. Um, but the the response has been overwhelming. They love our clientele, um, which is great for us. We you know we 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 love, and we and we are in the position to really vet the people that we work with. Um, we've turned down a number of contracts because we just don't feel that. They have the same value system. Um, you know, some companies don't have the same value system as what we are commonly used to. So, but yeah. Cool. Um, just an another question here, guys, from Patrick. Can a work permit be a way to speed up my move to Australia? If yes, can you all immigration continue with the PR while I'm working in Australia? That's a very good question. So I'll give you an example. I, I've got uh, the same client that I, I spoke of earlier on, Neville. He's gone over to this macadamia farm um, on his uh, 482 work permit. And we are going to be finalizing him and his wife, um, their, their permanent residency on shore whilst they're in Queensland. So, yes, we are able to do so. That's a nice thing about Australia is that you can actually do things on shore sometimes. Like, for example, South, Africans immigra South Africa's immigration system, there are restrictions with regards to what you can do here and what you can't. Sometimes our clients who are doing South African visas have to return back home before they can apply for visas to come back in. Australia is somewhat different in some respects, um, making it convenient to actually get stuff done on shore, which is really, really cool. cool. Another good question here from D is, uh, what about uh, your your parents? So wow. j just a quick one there. There are a number of different types of visas that uh, a parent can apply for. Um, there, there's a whole list. And you must be very careful about which particular pathway you choose because you can apply for one, but it may not allow you to apply for another at a later point. Um, they become quite sticky that way. But there are a number of different visas. Um, the the 870 that he is referring to, or a 870 once you have settled in Australia. So it's called settlement. And generally, you have to have been in Australia for at least two years, 24 months in uh in in oz um they basically want to see that you've settled and you know you you've you've got a settled lifestyle and you've got a household you've got an income uh you know you you're looking after yourself before you're able to start sponsoring extended family coming in and that's pr status sean two years pr status yes permanent yeah. residence yeah yeah they yeah. also on a 189 yeah exactly exactly i don't 
say something uh, about the recruitment division um, quickly, Sean, sorry yeah, sure. to interrupt you. Um, paperwork, when it comes to that, doing like online job applications is like such a tedious process. You won't understand, like it is horrible. The amount of information, like I don't know how it is in other fields, but especially as an educator, the stuff they want to know and having to fill in those forms over and over and over and over and over again, like eventually you just don't want to do it. It actually becomes like so tedious that it's like you, you cannot possibly do any more forms that day to fill in that. And that's what's awesome about um, the recruitment. You do it once and you guys send out information off to different schools instead of having to apply yourself from school after school after school after school. Um, that also makes the process a lot quicker in to get a job. Um, so for any, like you say, for any um, job that people are looking for, it sounds silly, but when you're the person sitting there and you've done five applications, and it's literally taking you an hour application, um, that makes a huge difference in how quickly you're going to find a job and get a job. And you guys all have all our information and it gets like broadcasted from there. So that also takes off hours and hours of work of trying to find your own job. Yeah, I think over the years, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that, and, and I appreciate that, Simon. Thank you so much for bringing that up because there's there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to make life a lot easier, not not only for our clients, but for ourselves as well, you know. And over, um, you know, the, the, the 12 or 13 years that we've been in operation, it takes a long time. To, you know, there's so much going on. So um, we, we've tried to refine and fine tune this as much as possible. So we started the recruitment division back in 2016 and we've been developing where we, we started off by placing plumbers in Australia um, and we, we've placed over probably about 60 plumbers since then. Um, and, and with the demand for teachers now and diesel motor mechanics and, and the list goes on, we've had to try and refine this as much as possible to make it easier for all parties, employers, recruiters, ourselves, the clients, um, you know, there's so many people involved here. So if you can make this easier, please do. Now, Ton Tondurai, you say you're a diesel mechanic with nine years experience. Which visa do I qualify for? So I will tell you straight out that diesel mechanics are, are the most sought after profession out of any profession in Australia. We've experienced the most urgent demand. In fact, we were speaking to a client the other day and we said, He's, we, were, we were, you know, entering into a contract and he's in, and we asked him, how many diesel mechanics do you need? You know, to, he said, if you have 40,000, I'll take all of them. So, <laughs> so <laughs> there's just, because of all the construction and the development going on and, and, and the, it's a and the mines. huge piece of land with a very, very small population. It's a tiny population compared to the size of the space. So Australia is going through an economic and construction boom. There are mines, there's con this construction industry is pumping. Um, there are mines everywhere, um, and um, and diesel mechanics are highly sought of. Yeah, to give you an example, uh, just on that note as well, there, there are over two hundred active mines in Western Australia, and uh, you know the, the, a lot, a lot, a large percentage of the working force is going into retirement within the next five years um, due to the baby boom effect that took place in the fifties. So, this is adding a lot of pressure on the labor markets on that side. So hence you in demand and hence the amount of opportunities available on that side. Um, a few of you have asked whether or not this uh, is being recorded. I'm pretty sure you just heard that right now, but this entire um, uh, webinar has been recorded, which we'll be sending to each and every one of you just to watch again. Um, and just on a final note, I'd like to thank Robbie. I'd like to thank Carlos and I'd like to thank someone for joining us this evening um your your words have been i'm sure very been very helpful and very inspirational to many of those that have joined us so thank you for that Simon. it's, it's been a huge pleasure working and with guys you so if far. you're going to australia just and you and you and you have any questions just please you know give some on a call <laughs> i promise you guys i promise you that. Listen, 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 sean i'm really I, that's why i'm a teacher i'm willing to help wherever i can and the amount of love and help you've gotten i am just so happy to share that because I wouldn't know half of what I did if it wasn't for other South Africans helping me. So Sean is welcome to share my my contact details. I don't think you want that. We've got so many. We've got so many people coming on board right now because of the conditions in the country. But um, well, I tell you what, I'm, I'm going to start your own Facebook page and, 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 and we'll charge. We'll, we'll charge like a two thousand rand entrance fee to get okay. onto that Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be the first one on then, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I, I, I've got to pay top dollar for this. This this was incredible. 
Um, yes, if so anyone wanna... is seeking contact, please. I'm really, I am really, really willing to help. So, um, so really if nice. anyone, if anyone says anything, Sean, please pop me, send me the message. I'm happy to help where I can. Absolutely. No, I definitely do that. And um, there are many teachers that have joined us this evening as well, or, or artisans that are married to teachers. So, um, you know, coming from the horse's mouth is always great. You know, that that really is amazing. Um, and guys, I, I'd just like to finalize this on, on, on a final note is, again, each and every one of you have gone through the steps, the stages, the qualifying criteria. We've been doing this for over a decade, um, for over 7,000 families. This is what we know. This is what we do. Uh, and we do this with passion. And uh, I look forward to working with each and every one of you. Let's get started with the initial stages. Um, you know, take one, 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 one foot uh, moving forward, one step at a time, and uh, we'll slowly but surely get to the point of uh, getting an approval. I look forward to working with each and every one of you. Thanks again for joining us. And we'll be sure to send out this uh, recording soon. Have Thanks a great guys. evening. Okay. Thanks, Bye. guys. Bye, everyone. Bye. Ciao.